As Californians think about rebuilding, a picture of survival is starting to emerge. This Pacific Palisades house, built last year with several fireproofing features in mind, may very well represent the future of fire resiliency. In tonight's Eye in America, CBS's David Schechter returned to a Colorado town destroyed by fire to show us what's known as the passive design approach. You want a little bit of yogurt, bud? It's hard to miss that four-year-old Alex Ela is enjoying having a news photographer visit his new house. <laughs> it's nice to have something to smile about. The fire was two days before his first birthday. Let's go. We're going to go now. We're going. A wildfire is still tearing through Boulder County. The Marshall Fire was the worst in Colorado history. Eric Ela's family lost their home two cats, and have lived in four places in three years. It's like, oh, are we going to the new home or we're going back to the new home? It's like, no, this is the home. Like, yeah. we're, we're home now. Uh, we're staying. Yeah, yeah. When it came time to rebuild in their town of Superior, where new construction is everywhere, the Elas chose a design concept called Passive House. It behaves different in a fire than a traditional house, where embers get sucked inside through roof vents. It's one of the reasons why we've seen homes in Los Angeles burning from the inside out, something the passive home seeks to prevent. There's very few places for an ember to get caught. Johnny Rizvani, who supplies materials for passive homes, is telling us compared to the roof vents on most houses, this house has just a single air intake and inside a powerful filtration system that controls the flow of air keeping the embers out. As opposed to most homes, you've got a lot of different vents for a lot of different purposes. In this has of, one. This has one intake. Uh -huh. And in an extreme weather situation, what you would do if you had to evacuate is you would close off that intake. This home in Los Angeles, the only one still standing in its neighborhood, followed similar building principles. But the challenge for some homeowners is the cost. It can be up to 7% more to build a home like this. And that might be one reason why just six of the 300 homes that have been rebuilt in this town are passive. But there is another way that the state of Colorado is dealing with this on a much larger scale, and that's a new state law. Right away, I was shocked that we don't require building standards. Lisa Cutter is a Democratic state senator. Why was that surprising to you? If your house isn't well protected and you don't do everything you can and mitigate for fire around the property, et cetera, then you're putting your neighbor's house at risk. In Colorado, more than one million structures are built in places that meet or mix with natural areas where there's a threat of wildfire. Across the U.S., it's 48 million homes, or a third of all housing. Cutter pushed for the creation of Colorado's Wildfire Resiliency Code Board. It will identify areas with the highest wildfire threats and for the first time enforce mandatory wildfire construction codes. People should be building in a way that's appropriate for the environment they live in. When you think about climate change, do you feel like you need to be prepared for things that are worse than you ever thought they were going to be? I mean, we've ex experienced something that I never thought you'd experience, and I'm, I'm ready for it to happen again. Across the West, the time has come for some people to rethink how they live with fire and how they rebuild from it. For I in America, David Schechter, Superior, Colorado. The forests needed to be thinned to prevent wildfires. Native Americans needed firewood to keep warm. Sometimes things work out just right. Janet Chamlian has tonight's Eye on America. It's a tradition as old as the Washoe tribe itself. A home heated by a wood fire, the way Eileen Maisie, a Washoe elder, has always lived. Without the stove, what access would you have to heat? Without the stove, um, at this time, we would have no heat. The custom is harder to hold on to in modern life, as most tribes don't control the land around them, and can no longer take the trees for firewood. But now a creative solution through a partnership between the National Forest Foundation and eight tribes across five states. A win-win. Wood banks created from trees cleared for fire prevention that otherwise would have gone to waste. This is what they brought you? Yeah. It goes to Native American communities, where poverty rates are almost twice the national average, and where a cord of wood lasting 6 to 12 weeks can cost a budget-busting $400. When you don't have it, it's life or death. 
We visited a national forest near Maisie's home, where Caitlin Lonergan of the National Forest Foundation told us too much wood can be dangerous. Why does this wood have to be taken out of the forest? We're dealing with an overgrowth problem. We are taking this material off the landscape so there's not as much fuel to burn. On average, a California fire season burns close to a million acres. January's Los Angeles fires burned more than 16,000 structures. Lonergan showed us this snow-covered pile that's been cut down. The forest thinning reduces tinder that can drive a wildfire. It's material that we need to get rid of, but it's not much value in more traditional markets. But it's of immense value to indigenous communities across the American West, facing bitter winters with limited access to affordable heating. What is the significance of a partnership between tribes and a federal agency? Over the past 150 years, Washoe Tribe has been shut out from a lot of its historical lands. And now being able to have some influence on what is actually happening in the tribe's ancestral lands. Most of this is Jeffrey Pine. Kenneth Cruz oversees distribution to the Washoe tribe, a community of about 1,500 near Reno, where elders like Violet Pete get the wood for free. What was it like that first time they delivered to you? It was nice and I didn't have to worry about wondering where my next wood was going to come from or how much I could use. We want to be able to preserve that beauty and continue to pass it down for not necessarily just our children, but for everyone that's here. The land's original stewards, now allies with the government, preserving forests and sustaining native tribes. For Eye on America, Janet Shamlian, Dresslerville, Nevada. Wildfires in this country are expected to grow in number and intensity because of climate change. For tonight's Eye on America, Carter Evans visited a special fire lab doing cutting edge research into so-called mega fires. Tucked beneath Missoula, Montana's snow-capped mountains, there's a laboratory unlike any other in the country where scientists are starting fires to better understand how they burn and how to manage them. Look at this uh, fire tornado phenomena. We watched mechanical engineer Jason Forthoffer replicate a fire nado. You get these super strong winds in there, just all naturally driven by the fire. Are these indicative of more extreme fire behavior? Absolutely. As that increases, I think we should expect to see more of these fire tornadoes. Looks like the flaming front of a fire coming through. Exactly. That's the intent. Fire scientist and lab leader Mark Finney showed us this burn table to demonstrate how circulating air can impact a hillside fire. It's drawing it up the slope. It's drawing it up the slope. And so this is one of the reasons why it's so dangerous to be upslope of a spreading fire. The U.S. Forest Service built the Fire Sciences Lab in 1960, inspired by a forest fire that killed 13 firefighters. Today, about 80 employees are carrying on that mission of wildfire research, and they keep coming back to one controlling principle. We're part of the problem. We're definitely part of the problem. Finney believes we still don't implement some of the basics, like clearing dry vegetation with more prescribed burns, including near urban areas, and letting some smaller wildland fires burn to eliminate fuels that could feed larger fires. The harder we fight fire, the harder we try to remove fire, the more the fuels build up in a given location. We've actually created conditions that make those fires worse. This lab allows the uncontrollable to be controlled and studied. Finney took us to a silo where his team assembled dry logs and lit them on fire to simulate wind-fueled flames on the forest floor. It's creating its own weather in that it's sucking air in. It is sucking air in. And what they're learning here has never been more important, following a slew of massive wildfires, including ones that recently destroyed thousands of homes in Los Angeles. California's governor's office called the fires unprecedented. Is it really that unprecedented? I don't think so. It's the same fire events over and over again. And yet decades go by and, and those, those lessons and those, those impacts are often forgotten. He hopes what they learn from studying the flames can change the way we approach wildfires. How do you convince a community that lighting a fire near their homes is a good idea? It, the question is, what risks do you want? To experience the very low risk of having problems with prescribed burning, or do you want to basically roll the dice and just wait till circumstances overwhelm uh, emergency response? Let's get out, let's go. We've proven that we can't eliminate fire. The only choices we really have are when to have it and what kind to have. 
And that will require a change in perspective, looking at fire as an ally, not an enemy. For I in America, I'm Carter Evans in Missoula, Montana. For years, the auto and insurance industries and federal regulators have been working to build safer cars, cars that give us better protection in a crash or fire. But what about our homes? What's being done to make them safer? Jonathan Vigliotti shows you in tonight's Eye on America. This six-story wall of fans in rural Richburg, South Carolina, is built to simulate disaster. Hurricanes, hailstorms, even wildfire. The target, a one-of-a-kind test site, engineer Ann Cope calls the neighborhood. This is what you would call an accessory dwelling unit or a small home built to the California Chapter 7A code, and we're going to threaten it with an exterior wildfire. Experiments like this are to housing what crash test dummies are to cars, and they all happen here at the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety a nonprofit funded in part by the insurance industry. The science that these tests bring us are how, when, how fast, and with what threat to the rest of the neighborhood do our homes burn. Today, Cope and her team are testing 60 mile per hour winds and fire against these two small homes. These are the type of wind speeds that we see in the Eaton, Palisades, Marshall, Lahaina. Insurance companies use the research to help set coverage rates. These tests also drive fire code recommendations for policymakers, including what materials to use. We're doing the messy, destructive, hot, burning science so that we can have that impact on the code. Within 20 minutes, the structure built to current California fire code is fully engulfed. The surviving home built to higher standards, dual paned tempered glass, boxed in eaves to block embers. If you do everything right and your neighbor doesn't, it still fails. Before his role as IBHS CEO, Roy Wright worked at FEMA. He says while some local governments have been slow to take action, some developers are stepping up. In Escondido, outside San Diego, a first of its kind community is being built to IBHS standards and at little to no extra cost. They're keeping 10 feet between each one of the structures. If one of them does get fully enveloped, we're giving the house next door a fighting chance to be able to survive. Insurance providers are taking notice. While many are pulling policies in California, homes like these are getting coverage, in some cases at reduced rates. Everybody wants to get back into their neighborhood. Everybody wants to go home. From the ashes comes an opportunity to return to a much safer home. For I in America, Jonathan Vigliotti in Richburg, South Carolina. In tonight's Eye on America, you will see a photograph that once appeared on front pages around the world. We caution you, it is an eerie photo. But that one picture over the past half century likely saved countless lives. Here's Mark Strassman. Oh, look at this one. This is when I turned the corner. Stanley Foreman's news photos have gripped Boston for decades. A scrapbook spanning nearly 60 years of city history. Foreman is now 80. He still listens to three police scanners in his truck. My idea is to beat them so they need my stuff. A freelancer hustling for the next big photo. So you're standing here. I'm on top of the uh, fire. But the image he'll always remember and Boston never forgot, is the one he took of a fatal fire a half century ago today. Right up there. In this Boston alley, Foreman came to a fire racing through an apartment building. A firefighter had just reached a young woman and a two-year-old girl trapped on a rickety fifth-story fire escape. He said, I'm going to climb up and I'm going to hoist you up and we're out of here. And then it went. It collapsed. The fire escape collapsed. I mean, you know they're falling. There's no doubt they're falling. And the fire escape coming down behind it. Firefighter Robert O'Neill dangled with one arm clutching the ladder and survived. But the fall killed 19-year-old Diana Bryant. Two-year-old Tiara Jones landed on top of her and lived. I realized that two people had fallen to the ground. You said you were shaking. Oh, 
I was, yes, I, I just watched something awful. Awful happen. I never had doubts about getting the picture, but I saw something awful happen. Does it still get to you? Yes, it does. I watched death in front of me. I mean, I was like a part of this. This haunting image, published worldwide, earned Foreman the Pulitzer Prize for spot news photography, his first of three Pulitzers. It also woke up Boston. Oh my God, this is what can happen when firescapes need to be used during an emergency and they're not in good repair. What sort of regulations, inspections were in place? Well, there were no regulations at the time. Warren Kindler is director of the National Fire Escape Association. Within months after Foreman's photo was published, Boston changed city code to require fire escapes be certified as safe every five years. The impact of that photo is undeniable. 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 It had a ripple effect throughout the country. Foreman told us the photo's power is simple. I, well, I think it scared people, and it also made them aware. How's my fire escape? I mean, I remember reading stories, people going out and testing their fire escape. This could happen to us. Stanley Foreman did more than chase Boston history. He changed it. For I in America, I'm Mark Strassman in Boston.